All right, my friends, here we are again today. So thankful to be with you as we come together for our daily devotionals um, during this week of Holy Week. Uh, today's a special day in the life of Holy Week. It's Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday. Um, the idea of celebrating a new commandment, and we talked about that back um, on Monday. A new commandment I give you, Jesus says, love one another the way I have loved you. You are to love one another. And so today's the day we celebrate the way that we love God, we love people, the way that Jesus Christ um, loves us. So, so thankful to be able to be a part of this day with you as we uh, continue to put our focus on Jesus, uh, both uh, loving one another, tomorrow looking at the way that he loved us through his death on the cross, and then um, looking at um, Easter Sunday, the way that we see his divine love um, poured out in his resurrection. So what a joy it is to be uh, just children of God and to celebrate this time, no matter what is happening um, in our world with this coronavirus, we are still thankful that Jesus Christ is the risen King of the Lord of Lords. Amen. And uh, thankful to be with you here today. A couple uh, quick announcements to let you know about. First one is this. Tomorrow, the devotion will be on John chapter 18 and 19 as we look at the crucifixion of Jesus Tomorrow, I'm going to be live streaming at 9 a.m. I have a pastor's meeting um, at 10 o'clock um, uh, you know, online. And so tomorrow, uh, we'll be going at 9 a.m. live if you want to join live. Of course, all these are taped, and so you can watch them at any time. That's good for your convenience. But just a heads up about tomorrow. And then tonight, I want to invite you to come back and join Amy and I uh, here on the live stream at 6.30 as we uh, have a time of worship for spiritual breakthroughs, it's just been on my heart for us to pray for the mighty move of God to come, um, and, and not so much in our world, I mean, absolutely that, but um, prior to anything happening with this virus, I just felt the Lord was saying, you know, I want you to be praying, I want my people to be praying, calling out my name uh, for spiritual breakthrough in their lives. And so tonight, we're going to do that um, through some time of praising God through song, looking at scriptures, having a chance just to pray and press in uh, to the way that God comes to bring spiritual breakthrough in our lives. And so we'll talk about that more tonight. Uh, today we're in uh, John chapter 17, and this is a prayer. Jesus has been teaching his disciples. They've had uh, the Lord's Supper that we call it now, uh, the Passover meal, but he now turned that into the Lord's Supper with Holy Communion. Um, and, 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 and now he's praying over his disciples. And, um, and in this prayer, we're not going to go into all of it today. In this prayer, he prays uh, for them to uh, be protected, uh, to pray for his disciples to be unified, uh, pray for them to be one in the love of the Father. Uh, one of the neat things about Jesus praying is that he prays not only for his disciples who are with them there, but he prays for us, actually. Let's up a prayer for all those who come and to know him in faith. In the Lord. So just a, a powerful prayer that Jesus lifts up. We're going to look together here at uh, verse 1 and, and, and the first several verses today. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. Verse 3. And this is the way to have eternal life. You ever wonder, how do I have eternal life? Or you're talking to someone. You know, they're like, how do I have this eternal life? Here's a great scripture to share with them. To know you, Jesus says, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you have sent. The idea of know there is one of intimacy, not just a head knowledge but one where we know the presence of Jesus Christ alive in our lives because he has come to rescue our souls, is to know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a real personal way of relationship um, in life. To know what he's done for us, to receive that precious gift of all that he's done to rescue our lives, to transform us into new creations, and then to live out our lives for his glory. Then he says this, verse 4, I brought glory to you, here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. There's two things here out of these first four, first four verses I want to share today. First one is this. He says, Father, the hour has come. Everything is within the timing of the Lord. He 
And so Jesus, who's been living his life, going back doing the ministry of God, he says, Father, the hour has come. The hour where he will uh, give up his life, where he'll die on the cross, where he'll take all of our sins, where he'll take uh, God's punishment against sin, the wrath of God, upon his own body. That time has come. The time has come also where he will be resurrected and bring absolute victory uh, for all who call the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the hour has come. Jesus followed, he trusted, he lived in the timing of the Lord. I want to tell you something, that the times we live in now are all controlled by the timing of the Lord. That God is going to use uh, this coronavirus in a way that's going to bring great glory and honor to his name. The Lord's able to take what is um, you know, evil, wrong, sick in this world, not that he creates that, but he's able to take us through different moments we're in and then use them to glorify his name. Something we should be asking ourselves right now in the season that we're walking through is, Jesus, what hour is this? Lord, the time has come. What does that look like in our lives? Lord, what is it that you're trying to, to teach me today, to share with me today, to show me today? I've got a good friend, uh, Sarah Lee, uh, who's a missionary in Nicaragua. Actually, she's in Papua New Guinea right now. Uh, about the time she arrived there to get some training related to uh, being able to further uh, uh, establish a revision of uh, the Mosquito Indian language in Nicaragua. Uh, by the time she got there is when all this kind of took place. And so she's kind of been in lockdown for three weeks now. And she's been able to have some worship and do some training. But it's been a really difficult time. And she was sharing a post about that day. Her loneliness, her struggle, just so many different things. But in it, she continued to come back to the way that God was showing her that he was with her in this moment. That this is his timing. That there's something for her to learn in this place. I want to tell you. That this is an hour that God has something for us to learn. Something for us to learn in our own lives. Something that we're meant to learn together as our family. Something that we're meant to, to learn as it relates to his greater work and purpose. That's going to come through what we're walking through today. We need to be saying, Lord, there's a reason why you are leading our world and us through this moment. And so as we lean into the grace of God and carry us through this moment, let's also be praying, Lord, the hour has come. I think a mighty revival is coming. I believe that a mighty move of us going forth and sharing the good news of Christ in our local communities and around the world is now. It's the calling of God to go in all the world and make disciples, right? Well, I think God is using this time to prepare people's hearts to be open to Him. It's in the midst of great uncertainty and trying times. And, and, and great upheaval that where we are so used to kind of holding on to everything we think we control. When, when everything's knocked out of your hands and you don't control it anymore, you realize you really didn't have control in the first place, right? You know? And so it reminds us who is always in control? God is. Who is always faithful? God is. Whose hour is it? God's hour. Whose timing is it? It's God's timing. Whose grace is it? It's God's grace. Whose provision is it? It's God's provision. We trust the Lord by living every moment in Jesus for the glory of the Father's name. And in that place, didn't you notice as you read this prayer today, the word glory is used over and over and over again. That word glory it contains the idea of the visibility, of the light, of the weight or the, or, or the heaviness of God's presence. When we talk about glory, we're talking about you know, God's glory is, it, it, it is brilliant. It's a reflection of his brilliance and his majesty. It's a reflection of, of his uh, being magnified. The idea of God's uh, glory is that he's magnified and he's greater. He's shown to be greater in all things. It's also a way when we talk about God's glory, to make God's glory known, is to, to make God you know, famous, to make God's name renowned. It's the idea of, of honor being given to a name, to, to God's name. And so we are people whose lives are meant to glorify the Lord. That, that the, the visible, brilliant, magnificent, heavy presence of God is one that we're going to know intimately in our lives, to know God in such a real and personal way. But in that way, we live our lives. Jesus said that he shared his glory with us, which means that his visible, manifest presence lives in us through the Holy Spirit. And so our lives would be one that radiate the brilliance, 
The majesty, the greatness, the renown of who God is. And this is the hour that Jesus would do that by dying on the cross. That he would lift high the glory of God. It is this hour when Jesus would be raised from the dead that the glory of God would be known in his greatest fullness there uh, here upon the earth. And so we're a people today who live in the glory of God, his manifest presence, his visible, brilliant, radiant presence alive in us. But we're a people of God also where the radiance of God, the glory of God, is meant to manifest himself through um, our lives. How do we do that? Jesus says in verse 4, he says, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. He's like, Father, I brought you glory. He's like, I've made your name known. I've magnified who you are. The brilliance of who you are. Lord, the, the light of your presence, the, the, the heaviness of your, your mercy, your grace, your life, Lord, of who you are. I made you know how by the work that I did. What was the work of Jesus Christ? It was to come to share the good news of God's saving grace and abundant eternal life. For all who came to call in the name of the Lord will be saved, right? The work Jesus did was to live a life completely surrendered to the Father, to live in an absolute obedience, and through that, to live a life of holiness, never sinning, so that when he died as the perfect sacrifice for us on the cross, he could take all of our sin and all the wrath of God against that sin and take it, and in his death, impart to us his eternal life. That's the work that Jesus glorified the Father in. I want to tell you something. There's a work that we are meant to do. And our work is to glorify, is to magnify, is to make known to the world the greatness of who God is and the way that he's come to rescue and save our lives. That's our work. Our work is to love God with all of our hearts and mind and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. That new commandment we celebrate on Monday and Thursday. Jesus said, love one another. The way that I love you, you are to love one another. So how do we glorify God? We do it by loving God, loving people the way that Jesus Christ has loved us. That's how we make God's name famous. Is by living a life of humility, surrender, filled with the Holy Ghost, who enables us to live like Jesus in the world, that our sole purpose is to glorify, to magnify His name by loving God and loving people the way that Jesus Christ loves us. We do that by the sharing of our testimony through word and action, by being diligent in how we share the message of Christ, even to the ends of the earth. I want to share with you a testimony today that I read uh, in a book uh, about a guy named Alan Gardner. Alan uh, was born in England in the 1800s. Uh, at the age of 14, he joined the British Royal Navy and uh, did that until 1826. Uh, um, um, so he did it for um, 16 years. So when he was 30 years old, he gets out of the Navy and uh, he's come to this place of just absolute surrender to Jesus Christ in his life. And the Lord just heavily just convicts his heart where he spent a lot of his time in the British Navy over in South Africa. And that area, God just gave him a heart to go back to Chile and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to people there uh, who had not heard, who did not know about Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so as he begins to go forward, he and his wife, uh, they go first to Tahiti, uh, begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ there, uh, and people are just kind of closed off to the message of Jesus. Um, it's during that time that his wife dies. Uh, he ends up uh, remarrying another lady, uh, and then they begin to travel further into South Africa, going everywhere from Argentina uh, to the Falkland Islands to Bolivia, and, and everywhere he would go, he would just be turned down. Uh, everywhere he'd go, he'd pass out Bibles, but not once did he see a, a convert to the Christian faith. And he did this faithfully as he made his way down to Chile, and we're talking about over a period of you know, 10, 12 years now, that he's going and sharing the gospel, 
you know, trying to be uh, 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 obedient to that call to go and make disciples for the Lord. Not seeing anyone come to faith in the Lord, but in his heart, he burns for Jesus. He burns for the call for the lost to be saved. Uh, he ends up, you know, getting to Chile. Same thing happens there. You know, people don't want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't want to uh, hear the good news of the Lord. And while he's there, he learns specifically of a group of people uh, called uh, the Again uh, Indian tribe. Uh, the Again Indian tribe. And uh, they lived on an, an island or an area called the Land of Fire. They were notorious for um, just being brutal to any uh, one who came there that wasn't a part uh, of their tribe. And yet God puts in his heart, I want you to go to these people. And so uh, he and his wife and kids, they go back to England. And, you know, we're now talking like the late 1840s, um, that time period. And he goes around trying to raise support, raise money to be able to take a group with them to go evangelize uh, this people group has not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, before. And, um, and as, he, as he goes back home, those people just really aren't interested. And he's kind of like near the end of his straw. He's in church one day, and he's preaching, he's just sharing the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. And, and it was said that there was a little boy by the name of Willie who was in the church that day. And God so moved his heart to want to help in this missionary call to go and share the gospel. People have not heard about Jesus yet. That he went up and he asked uh, Alan, uh, he said, can I have one of those uh, envelopes? And, and that little boy's being stirred by the Lord, really being stirred by the Lord Jesus Christ, brought conviction upon everyone who was there. And, and money was raised for a group to go, a group of seven people who went to uh, uh, these uh, the Agon uh, Indian tribe there in Chile. And, and so as they get there uh, to this island, uh, again, you're talking about rough conditions. The weather's like always bad there. Um, they go December 1950. It's wintertime. It would be notoriously just rough and cold in those areas. Uh, but they arrive. They've got supplies for six months. And soon after they arrive, uh, this Indian tribe begins to come and, and, and rob from them and steal, steal from them. And, and, and they don't really have an interpreter. They were hoping to find uh, someone on the island that knew English. They'd heard that there was a, a, a small group that had been taken, brought to England, and learned the language. They were hoping that one of them had made their way back. You know, there's no one there to translate for them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and so, you know, here they are, and, and, and it looks like a failed mission. Uh, but they're not leading. Uh, even though they are unable to, to share the gospel with this people group, you know, they're stealing their food from them. Uh, that in the, the diary of this missionary, uh, Alan Gardner, he continues to talk about how each day these seven men, they would get out there on the, the beach and they would lift up their hands and they would pray and they would praise and they would seek God's favor to move upon what they were um, striving to do to reach this people group. And, and shortly uh, uh, after their time there, um, they, they began to get sick, uh, they began to die, and then finally, uh, in like September of uh, 1851, uh, all seven members of this missionary party um, had died. Uh, they were hoping six months in to get supplies and help them to go back forward. That never happened. But I want to read to you just a little bit about Alan Berger's testimony uh, in, in his witness uh, for the Lord. It's important because when news got back about these seven you know, men from England who had gone uh, in less you know, it was like seven months, everything had been just, you know, they had died. They didn't talk to one person about the Lord on that island. You know, there are a lot of people who are critical. But I want you to read here with me about his, his, his testimony. He says, Every morning and noon and night, these men would go on the shore thanking God for his loving kindness and mercy towards them. And uh, Gardner's journal says this, let, Lord, let not this mission fail. Grant, O Lord, that we may be instrumental in commencing this great and blessed work. But should thou see fit in thy divine providence to hedge up our way, and that we should even languish and die here, I beseech thee, O God, raise up others to send forth laborers in the harvest. Let it be seen for the manifestation of thy glory and grace, 
that nothing is too hard for thee. And here's a guy who everything looks lost, everything is just failing. I mean, health's declining, friends are dying, they've not been able to share the good news of Christ. But here he is proclaiming to God in prayer, Lord, even if it's not us, Lord, send other people to come and reach these people for Jesus. I want you to go further down here. And he says this, um, Lord, at your feet I humbly fall. I give you all I have, all that your love requires. To lack is best, for all is yours. Take care of me in this hour of test. Do not let me have the thoughts of a complainer. Here's a man that's within two weeks of dying, and he makes this statement. To lack is best, for all is yours. Take care of me in this hour of test. What did Jesus pray earlier? He said, the hour has come. Gardner knew that his life had a purpose beyond himself, which was to glorify God. He knew that this hour was the hour that God had chosen him for come. It wasn't about the results. It was about the faithfulness to live righteously unto the name of Jesus. And then, like, I mean, do not let me have thoughts of complaining. How many of us complained because we haven't got toilet paper? <laughs> come on. And here's a man about to die who everyone would look at the mission he was a part of and say it was a failure. And he prays, do not let me have the thoughts of a complainer. This is what he says next. Make me feel your power which gives life and I will learn to praise you by carrying your cross. He's like, Lord, I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross and follow you. If it means dying, in this manner, in this state, away from my family, so be it, God, because my life's not my own, it's yours. And then this is the last words written in his journal. He says, by God's grace, this blessed group was able to sing praises to Christ for eternity. It's like, our Lord's, my life's not our own, but Lord, we're going to sing eternally for the praises of your name. Let me tell you what happens next. Eventually, people come within the next several months. They find the bodies. They find the journals from these men. They take those journals back. They begin to share the testimony. And people are stirred to send back another group to go and evangelize uh, to uh, the Jagan Indian tribes. Eight people go back, more supplies, you know, more funded, you know, better prepared for what's to come. They go to a part of Chile where there's another mission group, and they meet up with that mission group, and, and, and they find one of those uh, Yugan Indian tribe uh, members from years ago who does know the English language, he goes back with them to uh, his own people. And as they prepare to go, their plan is for um, this uh, native uh, uh, Yugan uh, tribe member to go and to, to help make a connection there so that they can have a worship service and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, when uh, these seven men landed, the eight stayed on the boat. Uh, when the seven men, men landed, uh, landed to go and to prepare for this, within five minutes, all of them were speared uh, and stoned to death. Think about it. Now, 15 people have gone to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a group who's never heard about the Lord. The first seven died. The other eight were killed immediately. And you're like, how does God get glorified in this? I want to tell you how God's glorified in it. News comes back to that mission society there in Chile, and they decide to kind of pack up everything and head on back to England. But there's a 17-year-old boy. His name is Thomas Bridges. The reason his name is Thomas Bridges is because he was an orphan, he was left on London Bridges, and he was given the name Thomas Bridges. This 17-year-old orphan boy who had been adopted by a missionary family that was in another part of Chile, who had come to learn the language of that tribe, when everyone else is leaving, he says, I'm staying, and I'm going. Did I say that he's 17 years old? Here's a 17-year-old young man compelled by the fire of God inside of his heart to go 
to this people tribe who have killed 15 people or have killed 8 people and have left 7 others to starve to death who are known to brutalize and kill people and he's like I'm going to go and he goes to this island and as the grace of God is upon his life they're not intimidated by this young 17 year old boy and as he comes speaking their language they begin to be absolutely humbled by his witness of faith in Jesus and by the way that he forgives them for killing his friends and fellow missionaries. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the testimony of Christ, of one who sought to glorify the Father by the work that he was called to do, the people on that island began to hear the message of Jesus to surrender their lives and be saved in Jesus' name, to call them in order to be saved, to be baptized. And you saw a whole people group, people group transformed by the power of Jesus' name. Where other people were ready to leave it behind, where other people were saying it's just too hard, where other people thought there's no reason to go in the first place, now God is bringing the harvest of souls to glorify His name to the point that within the next year, there's an Italian ship that crashes on that island. And now this people group is willing to help care for them and provide for them and look after them. Because Thomas Bridges, inspired by the Holy Spirit, empowered by Jesus Christ, seen by the testimony of those who have gone before for the gospel to be shared to this people group. Now, rather than taking the Italian people who had died or had been shipwrecked and killing them and taking all their supplies... Now they're helping to keep them alive and get them back home again. That's the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ came. He came to seek and save those who were lost. He came to those who people believe were hopeless and without any cause of being redeemed. And he gave his life for us. And he calls us in Jesus' name to glorify him, to magnify him, to express the brilliance and honor that is due to the name of Jesus by living lives that go and declare the good news that Jesus saves. By living out a life that honors and glorifies the Lord. That people would see in us the glory of God because we are so radically submitted, surrendered, and in love with Jesus and on fire with his purpose. Y'all, there needs to be a shaking and a moving in our lives. Because being a Christian is not about showing up at church. And being a Christian is not going through the religious motions. Being a Christian is realizing the great sacrifice that Jesus made in the hour that God had sent him to come and redeem our lives. And to be so on fire with Jesus Christ that we recognize this is the hour. This is the hour that we've been called to rise up in Jesus' name and to proclaim the testimony. Our God saves through the Savior Jesus Christ. Our God reigns through the Lord Jesus Christ who is risen from the dead. Our God reigns in us. This is how he saved us. This is how he transformed us. This is what he can do for you. This is the hour, my friends, that we are called to do the work of Christ and to glorify his name. May we become so convicted by God that we will allow the Lord to set us on fire again. To realize that we are called to go to the neighbor next door and to the Indian tribe around the world so that they may know the gospel of Jesus Christ. They may know God's love. And it's not ours to bring about the result. That's the work of God. Ours is the calling to love God. To love our neighbor as Jesus loved us. To go into all the world and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today I want you to think about the person in your life who's the lost cause. I want you to think about today the person in your life that everyone has written off. Maybe it's a student at your school that you teach. Maybe it's a family member who's addicted to drugs, alcohol, whatever it might be. Maybe it's the, the, the family member who's an atheist that says there is no God. I want you to think about today, the person you know, or that you might be encountered by today, that they are the lost cause. And remember today, they are not. 
Because Jesus died for those who are lost. Us. All people. So that we can be found in his grace. I want to encourage you to pray mightily today for the Lord to give you words. And I would invite you to call that person. I want you to, to, to maybe text them. Pray for them. But reach out to them and say, I want you to know, especially the people that know that everyone else has written them off, especially those people, you need to tell them today, listen, even though everyone else has said, there's no hope for you, I want to know, let you know that there is. That I'm here, and I'm your friend, and I love you, and I care for you, but more than that, Jesus Christ died because he believes there is hope for you to live in the graciousness of of his life. Would you pray with me today? Father God, I pray that in this hour that we're living in, there is a reason for it. It is to glorify your name. May the name of Jesus be magnified and glorified. May the Father be magnified and glorified. May the Spirit of God be magnified and glorified through the witness of your people. And Father, I pray especially today, put in us a revival fire for the lost for the neighbor across the street, for the family member who doesn't believe, to the one around the world who's not heard the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, put in us a desire to go and make disciples, to finish the work that you have called us to do, and in doing the work that you've called us to do, to bring glory to your name. Lord, hallelujah. God, to the lost cause today, we thank you that they're not lost. but only waiting to be found in the grace of the Lord. Let us be the messenger. Light us on fire in your presence, Jesus. But we love you, we thank you, we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. That missionary's name is Alan Gardner. I would encourage you maybe to Google that today. Spend some time reading about his life. Um, may God use the saints of old and the saints of today to pierce our hearts for a greater conviction to live faithfully and boldly for the Lord. Listen, we love you. Come back tonight at 6.30. Join Amy and I for a time of uh, praise and prayer for spiritual breakthrough. Have a great day.